it's wonderful to be here face to face, but I, I just echo Flavia, it's a bit, excuse me if I look like a rabbit in the headlights occasionally, because it's been a while since um, I presented uh, in front of a live studio audience in this way. I wonder if we can get the slides up at all. Is there, all right, green button? Oh, look at that, magic. So it's, it's especially great to be part of this session and showcase some of our truly collaborative work that we've done together with Impact uh, and the Wolfson Palliative Care Center. Um, and you'll see from the name of authors there, many who are familiar to you. But just also to flag that very importantly, we also have some clinicians, Mary, Tracy, and Sarah, uh, who work in respiratory care at the participating sites in this research. And I think that's really important. If you're going to say anything at all critical about a specialty, you really need some people from that specialty as part um, of the team. So uh, you're all familiar with the definition of chronic breathlessness, I hope, um, but it's worth highlighting that uh, it's sought to have sensory, affective, and impact dimensions. That's important because we think the handheld fan actually impacts all three of those, and Flavia touched on that a little bit. Um, Flavia's covered uh, much of uh, the other um, contents of this slide, and particularly the mechanisms, uh, which she did a much better job of than I would. But I'd add that I think there's also undoubtedly a psychological component as well. So really we're looking at a very multi a pronged mechanism um, and probably has different roles in different people, works in different ways. And there are people, of course, for whom it doesn't work at all. Um, but we think best guess estimates are around 80% of people with chronic breathlessness. That's from a range of studies um, may benefit. So, um, and as Flavia highlighted, it's cheap. Um, uh, and uh, easily accessible and very portable. It's recommended as routinely by dedicated breathlessness services to all patients. Um, and there's one or two guidelines also recommended, including the American Thoracic Society's guidance on dyspnea crises. So that's those acute on chronic breathlessness episodes that many pe people experience as well. But there's anecdotal evidence that it's not really widely implemented in respiratory care. And that was really the rationale for this study to understand, well, why not? Given this is a cheap, effective, non-pharmacological strategy, why isn't it really being uh, recommended a lot in respiratory care? So we used a qualitative approach with focus groups. Participants were clinicians of any discipline, working at two uh, major teaching hospitals in Sydney. Uh, we conducted the focus groups face-to-face -face or via Zoom, depending on the public health measures in place at the particular time. And I can say focus groups work really well if they're only on Zoom, but don't try a hybrid one. It's a complete disaster. Um, the people in the room just hide, and you only hear from the people on Zoom who can't. Um, uh, the questions we asked about current fan-related practice and their perceptions regarding benefits, harms, and what they thought the mechanisms was, which was very interesting. Um, and then analysis used an integrated approach where we first coded line by line in an inductive way, and then we used the integrated behavioral model um, Really, we chose that because we figured that clinicians probably have a fair amount of autonomy in terms of whether or not they can recommend the fan. So we wanted a model that was really focused on their intention and factors around that, and the IBM fitted that very well. It's a little bit small in the top-hand corner, but I'm going to go through each of the domains in the results. We had 49 clinicians across nine focus groups. Uh, you can see that they were mostly uh, female nurses, mostly working in the inpatient session. We only had a very small number of people who owned up to not recommending the fan to any patients at all. Whether that number is a little bit larger, we will never know in reality. Uh, but it's interesting to note that actually the majority were not routinely recommending it to everybody. They were uh, giving it to only some or most. And we were very interested to find out why and how they chose which patients to give it to. So overwhelmingly, the most important factor driving whether or not a clinician recommended the fan was whether they thought that the benefit outweighed the harms, not surprisingly. 
And there was only really one serious potential harm raised by participants, and that was that the fan could potentially spread COVID. Interestingly, views on that differed very dramatically between the two hospitals, and fans had been banned at one of the hospitals, as I think happened here. Um, but at the other hospital, they never were, and clinicians were free to keep using it throughout the pandemic. And the clinicians there sort of looked nonplussed when we asked about COVID um, uh, and didn't really see why it would be a big problem. Um, the only other reason that people, anyone actually gave for not recommending it was that there was a perception that a couple of patients they'd encountered had become over-dependent on it and therefore quite disabled when they didn't have a handheld fan accessible to them. Uh, people were very inventive with some of the other ideas they came up for, potential, Barry, potential harms. They'd sort of go, well, you could get a fire or you could, but they dismissed all of those uh, quite quickly. Um, they did, however, highlight some what they thought were patient perceived barriers. And Flavia mentioned a couple of these with people feeling a little bit embarrassed about using these devices. Um, they also said they'd encountered patients who were worried about pollen allergies, thought that cold, the, they could get a cold just from the draft, so not it spreading germs, but just that old thing about drafts give you colds, um, or that particularly for some cultural groups, it might be a bit effeminate for, for some of the men to want to use. So th this general feeling that there might be benefits and there weren't really many harms made the clinicians generally think, well, why not? I'll give it a go. And that's summed up very nicely by the advanced trainee uh, quote there at the end. So, interestingly, um, hardly any of the clinicians had had any kind of formal introduction to the fan. And by that I mean that they hadn't covered it in their training at all as a potential strategy, and nor had they, many of them actually encountered the literature on the evidence for the fan either. Um, and even those that had, actually that wasn't the most important factor. It was seeing it actually work for patients and hearing the patients really sing its praises that really uh, swayed them towards recommending it. And they reckoned that actually that was the way that they mostly found out about it, was patients coming in and saying, geez, doc, you really want to try one of these? Um, and um, also that patients would hear from other patients about it as well, rather from clinicians, which is very important when we think about how to disseminate um, news about the fan and get it into practice. So understanding of mechanisms wasn't really important in terms of whether they recommended it because they figured, well, if it might work, who cares how it works? I'll just, I'll just recommend it. But it did determine which patients they recommended it to. And particularly those, many of the clinicians thought, well, it's just a placebo. There's nothing really going on. And those clinicians were apt to only recommend it to the anxious patients. And of course, there were many clinicians who felt that there was a whole bunch of patients who really were only anxious and the breathlessness was really purely a factor of anxiety and those were the ones they would recommend the fan to. There were also clinicians who only recommended it at the very, very end of life when, when everything else had sort of run out for the patient. This was a last ditch resort and there were actually no clinicians who would recommend it during one of those breathlessness crises despite the ATS guidance saying that actually it can be quite useful then. Although I have to say that there is no direct evidence for that, other than sort of patients. There's no, not been an RCT done of breathlessness crises. Um, so many of the clinicians, unsurprisingly from uh, Flavia's uh, outline, were a bit unsure about how best to go about helping patients use the fan to optimal effect. Um, they weren't really sure which one, um, and I'll add to, to um, Flavia's list, you get ones with baseball caps with, with them on, you know, you get ones you can plug into your computer or your mobile phone. There's really a vast range. Um, they did tend to like the Lung Foundation Australia one because it's branded, and they thought that that added credibility uh, for the patient and made them more likely to use it. Although, interestingly, we, we really drilled the clinicians on this, whether they thought it lacked credibility, and we couldn't get any of them to admit to that, you know, that, well, this is all a bit too plasticky and cheap for 
a doctor to be recommending. We suspected that that would be a barrier. You know, it wasn't kind of medicinal enough, but none of them would admit to that. They all said, no, don't see, don't see the problem. I'm just focused on whether it benefits my patients. That's all. Um, uh, and they also varied widely in terms of the training they gave. Some of them just said, here's the fan, pointed at your face, off you go. And some of them gave them much more detailed explanations, really intended to try to get them using the fan. Um, uh, and those tended to be the allied health, the physios and the OTs that g gave a bit more uh, and also recommended it in conjunction with the other um, uh, uh, strategies. The biggest environmental factor, uh, not surprisingly in an inpatient ward, was just a lack of handheld fans. So they tended to use just a handful of desktop fans they had. And apparently the patients fought over those and would kind of sneak up and, and, and take the fan <laughs> from another patient's bed while they were sleeping and move it to their own. Um, even taking the fans home in some, in some extreme cases. Um, in other words, stealing. Um, uh, there was also a perspective that the, f the fan wasn't part of the protocol and the inpatient uh, ward in particular is a very sort of checklist protocol driven um, environment so that um, if it's not on the checklist it's not going to get done. So, um, we do have some study limitations, of course. Uh, we only had two hospitals. We focused on the inpatient setting. We're likely to have got a bit of uh, sampling and social desirability basic bias, even though we did uh, schedule focus groups for routine meetings rather than ask for volunteers to come along um, uh, for dedicated ones, although, of course, we did have to give permission to people to leave if they wanted to um, and not make them feel bad about that. We also got ethics approval for being really quite ambiguous in our participant information sheet in terms of how we um, frame the project. So we said, it's just, we, all we want to do is just hear about what clinicians think about the fan. We didn't tell them, you know, we want to know why you're not implementing it. You know, uh, so we, and we hope to give permission to people that weren't recommending it by actually asking them first as well before we got all the people who were singing its praises to, to um, jump on board as well. Um, and then using the IBM, of course, was useful, but uh, it's just one particular framework, so we might have missed a few things uh, using that. So, in summary, uh, both clinician and service level interventions probably are needed to drive implementation in this setting. We need to encourage people that this can be used as a first-line intervention for breathlessness, uh, rather than holding it back and only recommending it to some people. 80% of people seem to benefit, why not recommend it to everybody? Um, uh, and that it can be used during a breathlessness crisis as well as just for persistent daily breathlessness and that it can be integrated with other strategies, particularly uh, breathing techniques and relaxation is the feedback from patients. It works very well with those. And of course, we should be trying to make fans available on wards. And it's likely to be very cost effective when you think how cheap these fans are. Um, and indeed, even better if the patient can take them home with them uh, on discharge, that would be ideal. And I'll just leave you here with a quote from um, the CHAF study that Flavia mentioned, because this guy just really nails it in terms of summing up not only the benefit and the value add that fans can offer, but also where we're going wrong with respiratory care in terms of actually picking up on the fact that these people are breathless and that that, that is seriously impacting their lives. Uh, and you can't say it more eloquently uh, than he does. Thank you very much.